is an argument currently going on between communication experts about the nature of hypnosis. Some say that everything is hypnosis, and others say there's no such thing as hypnosis. Now, what I want to do this evening with you, because I've entitled this program Cradle Hypnosis, is I want to talk about the nature of hypnosis and tell you that I believe that everything is hypnosis. That is, that everything that goes on between human beings is hypnotic, and especially language is hypnotic. And later on in the program, I want to demonstrate that for you. And all of you in the audience already have taken a spool of thread and broken off about 12 inches of it. Those of you watching at home, if you have a minute to get a spool of thread, uh, I'd encourage you, if you want to do this experiment with us, and we'll do it in about 10 minutes, uh, that you get a spool of thread and break off 12 inches and get a ring because we're going to make a pendulum. And I'll show you what to do a little bit later on. But why talk about hypnosis, or why call this first program Cradle Hypnosis? Because I want to, I want to show you that our life begins in a way where many things come to us that the best way I know how to say it is that we all have been affected by a post-hypnotic trance induced in early infancy. And that it's not so much that it's totally determining or conditioning our lives as it is something that needs to be examined. Because each one of us began our life powerless in some ways, uh, powerful in some ways. The very fact that we were little and tiny and vulnerable drew out of the people around us the need to be needed. So we were powerful in that way. But we were powerless in the sense that we were very much uh, dependent on the family of origin that we came from and the mental health of those two people, uh, or five people, or how many people there were there. And that the words they said to us conditioned us in a very powerful way. And what I want to do in this series with you, what I'm really eager to do it, because I think it's important to talk about the developmental stages from birth to death and go through all the stages of personality development and to try to talk about what is a healthy personality. What constitutes a strong ego? Uh, you know, so much of our work in psychology has been about neurosis. I mean, everybody knows how to talk about neurosis, and everybody knows the terms about neurosis and what an inferiority complex is, and that's been highly publicized. But uh, as far as I know, very few researchers have spent most of their time looking at greatness, looking at what constitutes mental health and uh, uh, the people that have it. Very few studies have been done of the marriages that work, for example of the families that are happy. What most of the information we have is about the families that aren't making it or the marriages that aren't making it, the divorce rate or psychopathology, or unfortunately, a lot of our data comes from the antics of captive and desperate rats. Uh, and you know, that's a, that is a very poor kind of model to try to understand human beings. It may help us when we're studying cancer and stuff like that, but in my opinion, it's not a significant kind of data to have in relation to what is normative for human beings. Now, one of the men that did a lot of the work on healthy personality was a psychologist named Abraham Maslow. And I'm sure you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or if you haven't, I'm going to run over him in just a minute. But Maslow, at the outbreak of the Second World War, was too old to go into the army, and he was so disappointed that mankind was again going into a war. We had lost 11 million people in the First World War, and you know the, the tally after the Second World War was 70 million. And after the Vietnam War and, and the Korean War, 100 million people have died in this century. I mean, that's terrible when you think about it. At the pinnacle of civilization, 100 million people have died in the last 70 years fighting wars. Here we are, you know, the most advanced people in the world. So Maslow said, I know about the Blackfoot Indians in Canada. They haven't had any known violence in 50 years. I'm going to go study those people. And he spent the rest of his life studying greatness. 
what he calls self-actualized people because he considered that the goal of health, of a healthy personality, was to be self-actualized. Now, what that means will be different for everyone. There, when I talk in this series about normative stages of healthy personality development, I'm going to talk about the minimal requirements of health, what needs to be there for sure, but greatness always transcends those minimal kinds of e ego needs. And uh, Maslow found that self-actualized people accepted themselves. They had great sense of self-acceptance. And, and I guarantee you, in the, the, all the years that I've been working on myself and counseling other people, nothing is more important than that, to accept yourself and to trust yourself and to believe in yourself. Maslow said that was the character of personal power. See, because when a person accepts themselves, they're not divided within themselves. There's no divisiveness. There's no warfare going on. I accept me. I've made the best decisions I could make up to now. I've made the best decisions available to me up to now. Tomorrow I may make another one. But I, I know where I am, not where I should be. And lots of you have heard me tell the little joke of, you know, the poor guy gets lost in the mountains and goes to the mountaineer and says, I'm lost. Where am I? And he says, you should be in Chicago. <laughs> really helps. And the poor guy's going, what? And see, a lot of times that's what people tell me when they come for counseling. Uh, here's what I'm doing, but I should be. I said, but where are you? And they don't know. They don't know where they are, and they don't know what they want, but they tell me what they should be doing. You see? And that's a divisiveness. That's a warfare going on inside of you. That's a way in which a person is not themselves and at one with themselves. So Maslow said self-actualized people have personal power because they accept themselves. They're generative, loving, creative, response-able. They're able to respond to life. Disciplined. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in this series, in the several programs we do, is a statement, and I don't know who said it, but it was said by some poet, that of all the mass of freedom, discipline is the most impenetrable. It's the hardest to understand that in order to be free, you have to be disciplined. You have to know how to delay gratification. That you have to be disciplined in the sense of telling the truth. That you have to be responsible. You know, somebody once said the solution, what we have to do with life's problems is to solve them. And the guy then said, that escapes the mass of mankind. But the way to handle life's problems is by solving them. And see, there's all kinds of things we can do. I did this for years in my life. I uh, sat around stinking taverns and talked about the problems and the complexity of them. And I knew Freud and Adler and Jung and all the psychologists, and I could give all these diagnoses of the problem. And that was complex, but easy. Whereas doing something about it is simple, but difficult because it involves action and doing. So, you know, of all the mass of freedom, discipline is the most impenetrable. Now, I think that our life, our whole life from birth to death is affected by four factors. Genetics. There is certainly a genetic inheritance in everyone. But unlike the animals, we are not instinctually determined. We probably have instinctual predispositions. There's some evidence that there's a predisposition toward bonding between a mother and a child, and that there is clearly some evidence that there is a time of readiness in our life. There are developmental stages, what Freud called epigenesis, that our life grows in dynamic process in stages. Thus, the title of this series, The Eight Stages of Man. I'm going to talk about the work that Erickson did, his epigenetic chart of the eight psychosocial ego needs that he felt were minimal requirements for a strong personality. And so in some way, there probably is a genetic disposition toward the development of these things. For example, the first ego need that needs to be developed is hope. Squirrels have this naturally. They don't go out on a limb and hope they're nuts somewhere. Uh, <laughs> But you see, human infants do not genetically have a sense of hope. 
We know that because we know that babies die, a death called marasmus. You know, that hospital death where, where the child is not touched and interacted with. Marasmus literally means wasting away. And, uh, it's a, and if you've ever seen a picture of a child who's dying in marasmus, it's, it's an incredible thing. It's just like they're going back into fetal form. And there's a despair on the face of that child, which is probably my hallucination when I look at those pictures. But somehow it seems that to me. So uh, this, this epigenetic idea that does seem to be somewhat genetically preconditioned, but what I want to say is that we're not instinctually determined as the animals are. The salmon infallibly know wh what way to swim up the river. We do not know how to do that. We are socially determined. So it's not just genetics that condition our life, it's our families, it's our mothers and daddies, it's the culture that we're born into, and finally it's the choices that we make. Because you see, if every kid made the same choices of genetic predispositions and family input, then every kid in the family would be the same. So obviously kids make different choices. In fact, I think it was Viktor Frankl who had the the famous case of identical twins where one became a criminal and the other became a criminologist. And there is a real good example that there is this element of choice in human life. And I really want to hit on that strong because I think that of course we've been conditioned. And my mother and father had a great deal to do with my conditioning and my grandmother and grandfather and the Catholic church that I was born in and the religion that I was brought up in and the teachers that taught me but it doesn't mean that I can't change. Now, Erickson develops these eight ages, and the eight programs that I'm going to be doing with you are programs that involve this epigenetic development. Next week, we will do a program on the first two ages, or the first two stages, trust versus mistrust, and autonomy versus shame and doubt, and it will take us to about three years old. Now, one of the things that Erickson says that's very interesting is that out of this crisis, and he believes that life grows in crisis, and that's a very important point to me. You see, one of the influences of the culture in our life is to say, avoid pain at all cost. Why do we have an epidemic drug problem among, among our youth? Put something in your mouth and live better through chemistry. Relief is just to swallow away. You do not have to bear, even for a moment, pain, boredom, anxiety. There is a way out of pain. Now, all the wise men of all ages, first noble truth of Buddha is that life is suffering. It doesn't have to be morbid. As a matter of fact, if you accept that life is suffering, it gets kind of easy. <laughs> it, it's when people are walking around expecting Oz one of my buddies in AA talks about er, longing for Oz. And then it suddenly dawned on him that Dorothy wasn't even in Oz. <laughs> she was in Kansas, dreaming. Uh, and, and, and there is that tremendous attraction in us to uh, the paradisiac and uh, the mythological and the romantic. And, and you see, I think that what people like Erickson are telling us, what Buddha is telling us, what the Bible is telling us, there's no resurrection without crucifixion. There's no life without suffering. There's no joy without sorrow. And somehow that's part of the human condition. There's no life without death. That is part of reality. So these crises are moments of heightened potential and increased vulnerability. You're more vulnerable, but then there's the potential to grow. So to grow, you have to die. To grow, you have to say goodbye. And I've said it several times, depression is normal. It's a normal part of living. Because depression is the grieving that comes with saying goodbye. And a lot of times when people are depressed, they don't realize that it's really a metaphor of growth. They're leaving something they need to leave in order to grow. And that's crucial. That's a crucial kind of realization. And the real problem with depression is that they never work through the saying goodbye. They just stick with it. They get fixed. Third week, we'll be doing a program on the third age of man, which is, uh, the name of the program is our, you know, guilty, not guilty, because it's a stage where we start developing conscience. 
and guilt, the issue of guilt. The fourth program will be on the school age. Are you still getting a report card? The fifth program will be on the identity crisis, which is adolescence. And I think I've called the, the program Don't Start the Crisis Without Me. Uh, because one of the issues there is that if you don't go through the crisis, then you're going to have to go through it sometime. I see people 50 and 60 years old going through adolescent identity crisis. You've got to go through it somewhere. Then we'll talk about intimacy. They lived happily ever after, marriage, middle age crazies, and old age and aging. I call that program an all unwisdom wise. So I'd like to look at each one of these developmental stages and look at the ego strength that needs to be developed. And it's developed out of a relationship, out of a process, hope that comes out of trust and mistrust, willpower that comes out of autonomy versus shame and doubt, purpose that comes out of initiative versus guilt, competence that comes out of industry versus inferiority, fidelity that comes out of identity crisis versus role confusion, love that comes out of intimacy versus isolation, caring that comes out of generativity versus stagnation, and wisdom that comes out of ego integrity versus despair. Those are the eight minimal ego strengths that Erickson feels are necessary for the development of healthy personality. Now, I'm going to talk also about Piaget and some other people who have talked about developmental stages. Piaget talks about the intellectual developmental stages, and that's very important. But right now, what I want you to do is I want to talk about relationships. And there's a study <clears throat> in a book called The Magical Child. This is a beautiful book by Joseph Chilton Pierce. And there's a study that was done at Boston University in 1974 by two researchers, uh, doctors William Condon and Lewis Sander. And they looked at the random movements of children, the so-called random movements of the neonate, the newborn infant. And they began to study them. And through sophisticated analysis of high-speed sound movies on scores of newborn infants, Condor and Sanders found that these so-called random movements immediately coordinated with speech. Uh, for example, the computer studies reveal that each infant had a complete and individual repertoire of body movements that synchronized with speech, that each infant had a specific muscular response to each and every part of his culture's speech or her culture's speech. Uh, one infant, for instance, might move her, her left elbow slightly every time a K sound was made. Another one might move their right foot or their big toe when the fa sound was made in father. And they literally took these children and studied them and took all their individual movements and put them on a computer and played it back and verified that those children already synchronistically responded to that language. And that not only that, they already responded in the womb to that language. So when we talk about genetic conditioning, you see, then we immediately have to say, wait a minute, what about language? What about the thoughts of the mother? Now, I want you to take your pendulums. And I want to show you something about thoughts being in your bodies that correlates to this. Just put your hand on your knee. Those of you at home doing this, if you just sit in a comfortable position and put your hand, put your elbow on your knee and hold your thread with your pendulum. And what I want to happen in this experiment is I want you to experience this pendulum moving beyond your conscious control. I want you to suddenly look and see that that pendulum is moving and you're not doing anything to make it move. Just be open to my words. So holding the pendulum without trying to move it in any way, allow the pendulum to start moving in a horizontal direction from side to side. But don't move it. Now, don't, no, don't move it with your hands. Just let it do it by itself. The importance of this is to experience that it's doing it beyond your conscious control. It's moving from side to side, and you're not moving it with your hands. Just holding it and being open to it. Okay, now, without consciously changing the pendulum in any way, 
get it moving forward and back in a vertical direction. Don't move your hands. Just watch it do it. Watch it do it beyond your conscious control. Now, one more thing, without consciously trying to do it, get it going in a circle, either clockwise or counterclockwise, either way. Just let it start going in a circle, but don't try to move your hands. Now, I can go on and on with that. How many of you are experiencing that happening beyond your conscious control? Just acknowledge. Okay. What I want you to see in this, that this is the nature of hypnosis. That when I say words, those words go right into your brain. Your brain controls your autonomic nervous system, which controls little muscles in the end of your fingers, and it does it whether you want it to do it or not. So sticks and stones will break your bones and names will hurt you worse. <laughs> you can't not be affected by language. Every one of us have been fated by interpersonal relationships, by the words that mother and daddy were saying to us, whether they liked it or not, whether we liked it or not. Those words were going into our body. Condon, uh, Sanders and Condon have shown that the random movements are, of infants are not random movements. The thoughts of a mother with the baby in the womb are the, the mother's thoughts are affecting that child. So what is genetic conditioning? What is, I don't know. How much is coming from social reality and interpersonal relationships? How much is coming from genetics? It's both and, but the lines get very fuzzy here. And we begin to understand that we are very much fated. Transactional people talk about scripts and injunctions. That, that a daddy who may never say to a girl child, I wanted a boy, that girl will know by the time she's seven or eight years old through his nonverbal language. He gives her a machine gun for her third birthday. <laughs> uh, you know, it's Pat, he sees, she sees him playing football with another little boy, and she sees how excited he is. She begins to get the picture, there's something wrong with my sex. And that comes at an unconscious level. So mom and daddy are affecting us. There's no question about it. And we are fated. Next, next week, I'm going to be talking about those early stages of life and how we're affected by those relationships. Now, the culture affects us, too. Mom and daddy act out the social roles of the culture. They did a study of something like 200 families where they, where they had a boy child and a girl child, and they, they, the mother and daddy thought they were treating the two kids just the same. When they did videotapes of it and recordings of it, the daddies would talk louder to the boys than the girls. They'd hold the girl, you know, come here, little Guinevere, and they'd hold the girl. They'd take Ralph and go, hi, Ralph, you know, and flip him up in the air. And, and when they'd ask this mother and daddy, they thought they were treating both kids the same. See, the sex roles are already being influenced by the culture. And then the thing that I said earlier is pain. This culture that we live in is a mass conspiracy against pain and suffering. Now, I'm not for pain and suffering gang. I really want you to know that. I'm not promoting it in any way, shape, or form. But what I know is... It's some of the worst things that have ever happened to me are the best things that have ever happened to me. But out of the pain, there are places in the heart that do not yet exist. Pain must be in order that they be. There are places in the heart that do not yet exist. Pain must be in order that they be. That we grow through going through the crises. Life is trouble, boss, Zarba says. And, and the sooner we all accept that, the better off we are. That life is trouble and that we're not going to get to a healthy place. We're not going to be who we are without suffering. Now, I have said that here are the normal psychosocial developmental stages, and we'll talk about each one of these as we go on in this series. I also want you to hear from me that everyone is unique. Every one of you is unique. And while these developmental stages are, are, are being presented to you, it's not to say that you must slavishly try to follow them, because there are only minimal requirements. Greatness, creators always do different things. Nobody understood Freud. Nobody understood Einstein. They thought they were weird. When people are different, when they're unique, when they're transcending, 
often nobody understands them. So I want you to hold on to the realization that you are utterly unique. George Leonard says, you are the universe from a certain point of view. We're all the same and we're all different. Each one of us is the universe from a unique point of view. The goal of my life is to figure out how I am the universe. What way do I uniquely, unrepeatably express that? Like Condon and Sanders showed that every one of those children already had their own idiosyncratic responses. One was a big toe person, one was an elbow person, you see. And uh, doggone it, I don't want to be slapped in the camp of big toe people if I'm not one, okay? And uh, the idea is what I do is me, for that I came, the poet says. What I do is me, for that I came. Now in order to be me, I gotta be willing to go all the way with me. I may hear a different drummer. There may be stirrings in me that don't fit the rest of you. And in order to be me, I have to risk changing. Changing means dying. Changing means going from the familiar to the unfamiliar. It means grieving, it means depression, it means being in the middle of the trapeze bars <gasps> and nowhere to hold on. But that's the only way that it'll work is if you're willing to risk making decisions. We do create our lives in a whole lot of ways and we do make decisions. Everyone can be different than they are now. And the goal of life to me is to find out who you really are, not who they said you are, not who they hypnotized you into believing that you are. Who are you? Everything can be different. You can change. The choice is yours.